Thank you, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here, lovely to be in Paris. Um, yes, yeah, so the embarrassing thing is that I've been working on legitimacy for a very long time. So I started working on legitimacy in the context of my doctoral work. Um, so that's now more than 20 years ago. So um, I, even though I was interested in justice then, and I still am interested in justice, um, I had the impression that very much influenced on um, by Rawls in his political liberalism, that as a political concept, legitimacy is at least as important, if not more important, than justice. Um, and when I started working on legitimacy, now to give you just a little bit of personal background, I was actually doing a PhD thesis in economics, and I was looking at social choice theory. And um, um, af after having done social choice theory for some time, um, I basically got bored with it. <laughs> and um, I had the impression that the really interesting debates were happening in political theory, in political philosophy. It was the time when there was a lot of work on um, deliberative democracy. And of course, Bernard Manin, who is here, has done a, a very important work um, on this. And I was very much influenced by his work, uh, which emphasized deliberation as a source of legitimacy. And for me, something clicked when I read that work um, with the social choice background on, on the one hand and then this work on deliberative democracy. Um, it seemed to me that what really what, what I should do, which what I did in the uh, PhD thesis, was analyze the conception of legitimacy inherent in social choice theory and compare it to the conception of political legitimacy one gets from the debates in political theory, political philosophy, specifically in the debate around deliberative democracy. So I contrast this, um, um, the aggregative approaches that one finds in social choice theory with Arrow and others with the deliberative approaches one gets um, in the literature uh, in political theory and political philosophy. Um, so that is sort of my biographical background, why I um, started working on legitimacy and how I started thinking about legitimacy in this contrast between economic approaches and political theory approaches. But more broadly speaking, it seems to me, um, and coming back to the point I mentioned earlier that I got from Rawls, um, justice is, to use the um, uh, word that's now used a lot in debates in political philosophy, an ideal concept. Um, legitimacy, however, is a normative concept that responds to non-ideal circumstances. What should we do? How should we decide in a political context when we don't know what justice requires? Um, my sense is that this is a very important um, um, question and is an important question because the circumstances of politics are such that we usually don't know what justice requires. In general, um, in the political context, we are facing a lot of uncertainty, um, not just about normative facts, not just about the facts of justice, but also about empirical facts. Political debates are very complex. So and it seems to me that the right response to that complexity is um, a normative concept that is geared, that, that, that can do the work for us um, uh, in this context. And justice just isn't the right one, it seems to me. It's, it's too demanding. Um, um, it's, um, what justice requires um, um, uh, is often, from within political debates, more or less out of reach. Uh, but legitimacy can't be. So we need to think through the requirements of legitimacy uh, in such a way that we can establish whether or not political particular political decisions, particular political institutions are or are not legitimate. Uh, and I find that a fascinating question, a fascinating type of normative analysis. Um, so I think one feature one finds, not just in debates on justice, but also in debates on legitimacy these days, is that they tend to be dominated by a moral perspective. So the question is, what does justice require um, uh, morally and analogously, what does legitimacy require morally? Um, and um, that way of approaching uh, things has always struck me as incomplete. And that relates back to what I said earlier. I think that one feature of political life is the uncertainty that we face when we're trying to make political decisions, when we are debating in a political forum in newspapers about what we should do. These debates are characterized by massive uncertainty. So there's a certain epistemic predicament that comes with 
the political domain, which I find is insufficiently theorized on the whole. Um, um, the, the moral perspective tends to um, take over too much. Now, there are, of course, important moral issues in politics, no question, just as um, justice is, of course, an important concern in politics. I don't want to deny that for a second. Um, but it seems to me that the strongest advocates um, of a moral perspective on legitimacy tend to, um, tend to be those that I associate or that I, um, in the paper that you mentioned, um, describe as will-based approaches. Um, so they think that uh, in, the political, in political life um, in general, but specifically in the circumstances of democracy, there are important moral concerns that need to be um, um, fixed uh, in order for legitimacy to obtain. So they're trying to give a specifically moral answer to the question of what legitimacy requires, and usually these moral answers build on some democratic values, freedom, equality, and so on. The belief-based approaches, a second family of theories of legitimacy, um, have less of a say when it comes to debates on democratic legitimacy. But they, it seems to me, highlight a very important um, feature of political life, as I said earlier, that part of uh, what it is involved in good decision-making in politics as elsewhere is um, to get it right, right, to make the right decisions. So there's a contrast here between that way of thinking about legitimacy, which focuses on how do we get to the right decisions, and the other one which focuses on um, some conflict of wills, um, a, a problem of legitimacy that arises um, from respecting uh, people's equal freedom in one way or another. Now, my objection to the first, to the will-based approaches, is that they neglect the question um, of how to get it right. So I think the belief-based approaches um, have something to offer there. On the other hand, I think the belief-based approaches, there's a reason why they're not um, um, all that influential, especially when it comes to debates on democratic legitimacy, precisely because the epistemic circumstances often are such that we don't know what the right decision is, as I mentioned. So each of these two families of conceptions of legitimacy has shortcomings, um, especially when we're thinking of um, uh, political legitimacy in a context um, of democratic politics as we um, uh, have it today in countries like uh, France or the UK or the US and so on. So in the paper, what I try to do beyond um, offering an interpretation of these two families of approaches to legitimacy, of these two ways of thinking about legitimacy, is to argue we need to um, 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 preserve what's right on each side and reassemble it in a hybrid conception of um, political legitimacy. Okay, <laughs> well, Joseph Rans has uh, put forward very important work on this topic. Um, so it's really uh, work anyone who works on political legitimacy has to grapple with. And so what he argues, he originally comes from a law background, so thinking about legal um, uh, authority, not political authority. Um, but uh, many have used um, the work he's done on uh, authority in general, specifically legal authority, also to... Um, a great effect uh, in uh, spelling out what legitimate political authority would entail. So on Rawls, uh, sorry, on Raz's <laughs> conception, um, an authority, a practical authority, a legal authority or a, a political authority is legitimate just in case the directives of that authority allow those subject to the authority, state for example, in the political domain, to conform better with reasons that apply to them anyway. So the thought is there are certain things we should be doing. Right? And um, a political authority, a state, a government, um, they are legitimate if they allow you to do better what you're supposed to be doing anyway than on your own. Now a simple case to illustrate that is um, a coordination or a cooperation problem. Right? Um, without an authority telling you drive on the left 
or cooperate, on, on, otherwise we're going to punish you. Right? The, the, the good equilibrium might not be obtainable. Okay? So that's one way to think about um, how a political authority might help you to better uh, conform with reasons that apply to you anyway. You have reasons to solve coordination and, and, and cooperation problems, but that might, might not be so straightforward if we relied on the judgment of each individual. Okay, so the important feature of Raz's work is this notion that there are better and worse political decisions. There is, to put it really roughly, right, uh, in many circumstances, um, um, the, um, a decision that is the right one as opposed to the wrong one. But the individual subject to the authority, the citizens, say, are not in an epistemic position to identify the right solution, the correct decision. And so our political legitimacy requires some authority, a government, a state, who is in a better epistemic position. Okay? And that's where then my challenge comes in. Um, that's assuming too much, I think, in the, um, given the circumstances of politics as I described them earlier. Uh, very often, even a well-intended government might not know what is best. Okay? And then the question is, what happens to the Razian conception of political legitimacy um, if the epistemic circumstances are as I described them? And I think one problem that Raz has in this case, well, either he has nothing to say, Right? If the epistemic circumstances are not given, so we don't, there is no political authority who would be in a better epistemic position than the citizens, then we just have nothing to say. All decisions are um, equally illegitimate. That can't be right. right? Um, at the same time, um, if we were to interpret this conception as implying that in those um, um, circumstances, yeah, all decisions are necessarily illegitimate if we don't have the epistemic basis. That's not right either. So there's a problem, which comes from the epistemic circumstances of politics. And so, uh, so um, what I argue in the paper is that the hybrid approach has the advantage that it deals with these epistemic circumstances, it responds to such epistemic circumstances, and has something to say about what legitimacy requires, even in those adverse epistemic circumstances. So I, I define my defense of uh, when we need to rely on will-based, um, when we need to rely on a will-based ground of legitimacy uh, in those adverse epistemic circumstances. Okay, so derivative, um, um, the term derivative um, denotes. Um, or what I'm trying to capture with the term derivative is that there are certain epistemic circumstances um, uh, which um, uh, require a different solution to the problem of legitimacy um, than what the belief-based approaches uh, suggest. So it's a, a secondary um, um, legitimacy generating um, um, mechanism and it's derivative um, um, or, or it derives its value, the value of the second way of generating legitimacy derives from its ability to respond to an epistemic problem. Okay, that's just in terms of terminology. But the broader thought is this. Um, Rawls's work um, in political philosophy on justice and legitimacy has been extremely important, I think, because it introduced the notion of public justification. Right. So I think he captured something very important, at least in some circumstances, that wasn't his claim, he thought that's generally the case in democratic societies, but I would um, put it more modestly, in some circumstances, legitimacy requires some form of agreement, loosely speaking. That can be through democracy, where obviously a majority prevails and so on, but it's some form of, um, uh, find, some form of finding um, um, some form of settling on a decision um, when the starting point is uh, disagreement. Um, Rawls thought that public justification is the right approach to justification in matters of justice as well as legitimacy. Many working in the Rawlsian tradition have followed Rawls in this regard and um, that's most obvious in the public reason approaches. They take Rawls's idea very seriously that when it comes to the justification of principles of justice, perhaps, uh, but certainly um, 
when it comes to the justification of principles of political legitimacy, um, that justification requires agreement uh, among free and equal citizens. In this way of thinking about justice or legitimacy, um, the agreement-based approach to justification is fundamental. Right? The thought is we're starting with some notion of freedom and equality right? and we try um, to then um, get to a normative conception um, of justification or, or generally speaking, a, a, justification, a conception of justification that builds on this fundamental idea of freedom and equality. I said Rawls has done extremely important work, um, but what Rawls hasn't done is ask the question of when is it appropriate to switch to some form of public justification. He just postulated that that's the right approach in the political domain um, and contrasted it with more traditional ways of thinking about justification that come from epistemology, reliabilism, evidentialism, and so on. Right? So he postulated that um, political justification requires its own approach. Right? This, we have to have a divorce between moral and political theory and um, epistemology. Um, that may or may not be so, at least I think Rawls is right, that in many um, political contexts, public justification, some form of agreement-based justification is all that we have. But there's still an interesting question of when exactly, right? Does agreement matter? And when does it matter that we get it right, right? That we form our beliefs in a reliable or way or in a way that's best supported by the evidence, okay? And that work, I think, has, Rawls hasn't done, and that's part of the work that I would like to do. Okay, um, so that again is just another way of thinking about the hybrid approach of starting with the question of well, what was the right decision and invoking um, an alternative way of generating a legitimate decision uh, when we don't know what the right decision is and this alternative way is agreement based. Okay, um, so I'm not sure whether that answers your question, yeah, but just it's a perfect. <laughs> Exactly. So I, I, uh, in the paper, I focus on the contemporary literature exclusively. But you're quite right that the distinction I draw resonates with positions people have taken in the history of political thought. The, the closest um, 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 link that we have um, with the belief-based approaches are, of course, the divine command theories of legitimacy. Right? Um, so on the divine command theories, um, um, the, the right decision is the one that tr tr God truly wills, right? And those who are in a position to discern God's will are the ones that carry political authority because they are able to tell us what the right decision is, put it all rather simply. But, um, but with Enlightenment, as you say, right, this um, uh, conception of legitimacy became discredited and um, instead what we had were a conception of legitimacy which in one way or another built on equal freedom, built on individuals' ability to reason, um, representing the, what I call the will-based approaches. Okay. Now, if I am allowed to jump into the present, um, there is now a strange resurfacing right? <laughs> if not of belief-based approaches, but maybe that even that, but certainly of some idea that we need strong leaders and, you know, someone who tells us what's what. And um, so it's as if the Enlightenment <laughs> beliefs or the Enlightenment values, maybe I should say, are coming under pressure. And so I think uh, in response to that, I want to say two things. First of all, we need to take this seriously um, as a development. Right? We need to not just, um, I think, um, dig our heels in and defend democracy no matter what. I think we should be open to the question that maybe um, um, there are other ways of thinking about the political domain rather than democracy. For a long time, democracy seemed to be the inevitable political regime but um, there are now criticisms from all sorts, all sides, and so we need to take them seriously. And we, in particular, I think, need to take uh, the possibility seriously that sometimes democracies can get it badly wrong. Right? Um, <laughs> and um, I think that the hybrid approach that I um, propose allows us to do that. Right? It allows us both to um, take seriously the idea that sometimes there are right decisions and political legitimacy depends on 
political collectives making the right decisions and, and avoid wrong decisions. At the same time, right, um, and that's sort of my second comment, we should be wary of strong leaders in circumstances of uncertainty, right, because a strong leader is only as good as the cases that they're trying to pursue, as, long, as good as the, the goals they're trying to pursue. And when there's uncertainty um, about what the best way is, um, in which to live together, then we should be very careful right, with relying on strong leaders. So that's just a link to the present. So obviously I've taken in a great interest in what's happening um, in countries around the world. I was really happy to see what happened in France <laughs> this weekend, exactly. Less happy with what happened with the Brexit decision and um, um, decisions based on that in the UK. Um, but these are interesting times, right? And um, um, it's hard to know what to say, right, about these new developments. Um, um, but I do think it helps to try and think clearly. <laughs> and um, so that's my roundabout way of saying that so even though I do follow the political developments very closely and occasionally um, write small pieces uh, in response in sort of social media and so on, I also do believe that um, philosophy has something to con contribute as such, qua philosophy, um, in trying to think as clearly as possible about what's at stake. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs>